Hello, everybody, and welcome to the very first episode of the Senate Speaker Series with Scouts Canada. I'm your host, Kayla Moniz, and the, also the Council Youth Commissioner for the Greater Toronto Council. Thank you for joining us this evening. We really do appreciate you coming out. Before we begin, if at any time you have a question or a comment for our two senators this evening, please feel free to stick it in the chat. We'll uh, get to as many as we can within the span of the hour. It is truly very important to be civically engaged and as youth, as scouting youth, to be leaders in our community. Hopefully, this session will allow us to, be, to better understand one of the most hallowed sections of Canadian government, uh, the voice of sober second thought, the Senate. Now, uh, today I have with me here for our very first session, a day in the life of a senator, two uh, senators, one from Edmonton, Alberta, and the other hailing from Ottawa, Ontario, Senator pa Paula Simons and Senator Vern White. How are you guys doing today? Hello, Calum. Hello, hey. Calum, how are you? Doing well. Thanks for joining us. We really do appreciate you uh, as well, sharing your knowledge and obviously your insight as well. Uh, senator Simons, um, how did you get to be a senator? Well, that's a really, really good question because the way we pick senators has changed quite dramatically over the last couple of years. Senators used to be appointed uh, sort of at the behest of the prime minister. So the prime minister would pick somebody. Sometimes it was somebody who was being chosen on the basis of their public service. Sometimes they were people who had ties to the government, to the political party, whether they'd been donors to the party or former MPs or people who'd been involved in politics. Sometimes they were community leaders. But there were some concerns that that gave the prime minister, him or herself, too much control. So about five years ago, Prime Minister Trudeau changed the way we pick senators. And now it's done by open competition. So anybody in Canada over the age of 30 can apply to be a senator. You write an essay about why you would be a good senator. You get some letters of recommendation. You answer some skill testing questions. And then an independent group of panelists goes through all the applications and makes a very short list. And then, to be frank, the prime minister still chooses. But I think what this new system has allowed is for a lot of people who might not have been involved in politics before, who might not have been involved in party politics before, to put their hands up and say, hey, consider me to be a senator. So I don't want to take anything away from my Senate colleagues who were appointed under the old system, because there are some fantastic senators who came to the Senate that way. But as somebody who was appointed under the new system, I, I kind of favor the new system because it allows anybody who is interested to say, hey, consider me for a job in the Senate. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Um, Senator Simons, um, you are a well-known and reputed uh, journalist who covered a, a myriad of great cases over in Alberta. How have you used that experience on the floor of the Senate? Yeah, because I was a, a reporter and a political columnist for 30 years before I came to the Senate. So I worked in radio, I worked in television, but I worked primarily in newspapers. And what I've found is that a lot of the skills I had as a journalist are really useful in the Senate. So I'm really good at asking questions. And what senators do all day long is ask questions. They ask questions in question period, but we also have public hearings all the time where we bring in expert witnesses, uh, whether they're cabinet ministers, members of the civil service, experts from uh, from academia, for, you know, professors, uh, that sort of thing. And we pepper them with questions. And so I'm, I'm good at question asking. The other thing that has really been very valuable is an ability to read a lot of things very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, when you join the Senate, you get so much homework. It's unbelievable how much reading I was handed the first week I got there. And I was like, oh, wow. Uh, if you thought being a senator was kind of like a semi-retirement job, it is not. So an ability to read complex documents really quickly and be able to synthesize them and explain them to other people, that's that's really been important. But I think really being a good journalist is all about being curious, wanting to figure out what makes people tick, what are good policy ideas. And so those are the skills I use every day. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Senator Simons. Um, Senator White, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. Um, why did you decide to become a senator? That's an interesting question because it's uh, I had no um, no consideration to be a senator. I was actually I'd worked 32 years in policing, 25 years with the RCMP, 
the majority of which was in the Arctic 19 years in the three territories. And I was the police chief in Ottawa, had no political background, didn't belong to a political party, had never been to a political event. And in fact, had a phone call late at night on Boxing Day in, in 2011, saying it was in the prime minister's office. I laughed and thought I was having a practical joke played on me and hung up the phone. And they called, they called back and um, this time I thought, well, maybe they're calling for something, I guess. And uh, they said they were looking at hiring senators. And I thought it might be a reference for somebody because as, as I had said, I'd never, uh, I, I, in fact, uh, politics is probably not something I was, uh, would ever have considered. I would never consider running, for example. Um, and uh, they asked me if I wanted to be, uh, be a member of the Senate. And I said, I'd need some time. Uh, primarily because there were a number of things I didn't agree with uh, any government on. I always said that I found it very difficult to select someone to vote for because I never agreed with any of them enough to actually put an X down. It was very difficult every election. Uh, so it took me a few weeks to decide and um, then I uh, chose to uh, accept it. And I said initially as a uh, conservative senator, as I was appointed by the conservatives, but uh, I said as an independent senator, as my colleague does, uh, we have a uh, three independent groups in the Senate now and, and one uh, conservative group. Uh, and uh, both of us sit as independents and two different independent groups. So I think it's, I, I do agree that uh, since the change, we are healthier from a independence perspective. Um, I don't know uh, about the selection piece only because when I was selected, there was three of us who had no political background out of seven. Um, so I think some were being picked and, and I see some people now are still have a political background, but not necessarily connected to the government, which I do think is helpful. Totally. Uh, yeah, 100 um, percent. Well, thank you uh, for those great answers. We'll move on now just because this is our very first session. This is the very first um, speaker series with the Scouts Canada. Um, I'm going to ask a very broad question that either one of you or both of you can answer if you want to. What is the Canadian Senate? Well, I mean, you called it the House of Sober Second Thought, and that always makes me laugh because that phrase was coined by our first Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald, who was not very good at... Seldom sober. sober. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so what, what's important to understand is that the Senate was set up in 1867 to be something quite different than it, than it is now. In 1867, when Canada became a country, they had a House of Commons, which was full of people who were elected, the members of Parliament. But they were modeling their system on what there was in Great Britain, where in addition to the British House of Commons, they had the House of Lords. The House of Lords was full of very fancy people who were very rich and powerful and had hereditary titles. And so they came to Canada and they were like, oh dear, we don't have any nobles kicking around Canada. We don't have any fancy people who are dukes and earls and barons. So they effectively set up the, the, the Senate for two reasons. One, so that they could make sure that the House of Commons didn't get a little too uppity. And so they put into the Senate 72 uh, rich old white men um, who were mostly friends of the prime ministers of the day. And it was their job to make sure that the House of Commons didn't get too radical. It was also their job to represent the regions, and that was really important. Uh, of those 72 senators, 24 were from Ontario, 24 were from Quebec, 12 were from Nova Scotia, and 12 were from New Brunswick, and 12 and 12 is 24. So the idea was that that gave the two Atlantic provinces, which were smaller, balance. Now, the Senate is still supposed to provide regional balance and regional representation, but it's not quite just a private club for rich, you know, and you had to be rich. You had to own $4,000 worth of land, which basically you had to be a millionaire with property. Um, I was a reporter. Vern was a police chief. We were not millionaires. Uh, <laughs> those aren't the kinds of jobs that make you super, super rich. Um, so uh, the idea of the Senate now is to make sure that all the bills that a government passes are, are good legislation. So it's our job to analyze the bills, to read them really carefully, to suggest amendments, which are ideas to improve the bills. And we do have the absolute power at the end of the day to defeat legislation, but we don't use it very often. We can defeat legislation when it is unconstitutional, when it violates the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and then we have the power to say, no, absolutely not. Even if you're the elected government, we're not gonna let you pass that because that legislation is so fundamentally un-Canadian. 
but we can't defeat legislation just because we don't like it. Uh, we can suggest amendments, but at the end of the day, the elected government gets to set policy. We have that final hammer that we only get to throw when something really sort of crosses the line. That's great points, you know, and, and as well, if I may, uh, I think one, one of the tests I like to put on our value is how much time we spend working on bills versus the House of Commons. It's not uncommon for us to call in two or three times more witnesses and spend twice or three times as more time uh, questioning people before we actually make those amendments and push it forward. We don't have some of the other pressures that a member of parliament from Prince George might have where he's dealing with all of his or she's dealing with all of their constituents questions and trying to manage the other things in their elected life. So as a result, I do think we have more time, which has been helpful from what I've seen. Probably the greatest value is the committee work we do because it's been helpful allowing us to push forward things that nobody thought about. I mean, we had I think the cannabis legislation, I think we had 49 original amendments, uh, many of them which the government, I'm sure, or, or, or the opposition parties never even thought of. I think that's the value of the Senate more than anything else. I think the regional representation is uh, the icing on the cake. But for me, that cake is the fact that we have time and energy and we put it into those committees that are trying to deal with legislation. And the important thing, too, I mean, Senator White mentioned he's an independent senator. I'm an independent senator. Right now, about 80 percent of the senators are independent. We don't belong to any party. So Justin Trudeau is not the boss of me. Erin O'Toole is not the boss of me. Jagmeet Singh is not the boss of me. And that independence gives us a lot of power. I think not not sort of the typical power, but because the government needs a majority of senators to pass each bill, it can't just expect us to be a rubber stamp. That was a criticism people often made of the Senate in the past, that you know, if, if you were the biggest party, you had the most senators and the Senate just you know, shot, your, shot your legislation through. We don't, I don't know how much that was ever true, but it's certainly not true now because the government has to make sure that it counts and gets enough votes to pass every bill. And so we have, I think, an influence, maybe influence is a better word than power, that we didn't have before to get the government to consider our amendments. Mm. Yeah, totally. Clearly, the Senate is a very important body, uh, obviously. Um, shifting gears to a more humorous tone, I suppose. Uh, Senator White, you had a very elaborate story about how you learned that you were appointed to the Senate. Senator Simons, <laughs> I, I was told that many senators have a great story about how they learned, how they first learned that they were going to be appointed to you know, one of our uh, greatest governmental bodies. How did you uh, find out that you were going to be appointed to the Red Chamber? Well, it wasn't quite as much of a shock for me as it was for Senator White, because after all, I'd applied. But I applied, and then the uploader is really bad. I, 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 it was using, it was using, um, uh, oh, what do you call it? Internet Explorer. <laughs> so yeah. I had to I had to upload with Explorer and I couldn't even tell if my application had gone through. And then I heard nothing for six months. So I thought, OK, never mind. That's, you know, there's they're better, smarter people than me who are going to be in the Senate. And so my daughter and I were actually on vacation in Paris. She just graduated from university and this was my gift to her. So we were in Paris and I started to get these calls, not to say I'm appointed to the Senate, but they were things like, you know, can you provide proof that you live in your house and that your house is in Alberta? You know, can you tell us the value of your house? And I would get these and they were like sort of and I was I was in Europe. I was on holiday. And so they, they you know, and then they were asking things like, you know, can you tell us where your husband's late stepfather was born? And so I had to send I had to send messages to family members from Europe saying, hey, I just always wondered, you know, was Grandpa Jock, was he from Glasgow or from, like where? You know, so without telling people, because it's a secret, you can't tell anybody that you're under consideration. And so finally we got from Paris to Rome and ended up in Athens. And then they called me and said, stand by, you will be receiving a very important phone call. And time in Athens is later than it is in Ottawa. So we looked down and I realized that my phone was out of juice. And so we ran back to the Airbnb so I could plug in my phone and wait for this very, very important phone call. And by 2.30 in the morning when they still hadn't called, I, I, tech, I, you know, I emailed Otto and said, I'm really sorry, I'm going to bed. So by the time, by the time I heard, I was, I was back at the Edmonton Journal in the newsroom, in the office, and then I got a call and it said, you know, 
This is the Prime Minister's office. Please hold for the Prime Minister. There's the Prime Minister. And I said, you know, good morning, Prime Minister. And then I ran with my cell phone and locked myself in a, you know, in a room closet at the at the back of the building. But I came out and my editor came out and she said, were you talking to the Prime Minister? Now you have to understand, I mean, I was a political columnist. It's not completely insane that I'd be talking to the Prime Minister, but it would have been extremely unusual that, that the PM would have phoned me and that my editors wouldn't have known I was working on some story. And then it's very awkward because it's supposed to be a secret. So I had to do some pretty fast talking to explain. Um, oh, that was just a joke. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, that did not dis disappoint. <laughs> Now, <laughs> uh, back to your your job as being a Canadian senator. Uh, I know that it's incredibly busy, as you put it, Senator Simons, a lot of homework. How are you able to balance your duties on the Hill with staying connected to your constituents? Well, I think I'll let Senator White answer that one. Totally. I'm sorry, I missed the question. I lost you there for a sec. What was it about well, duties no on the Hill? Yeah, um, I, it's a very busy job to be a senator, uh, definitely. Oh, yes. How are you able to balance that that position, all the paperwork, everything like that, with staying connected to your constituents? Well, I'm quite lucky. I live in Ottawa, although I'm from Cape Breton Island. I, I was with the RCMP, as I mentioned. I ended up here. Um, I'm very lucky. I live in Ottawa, so I don't spend time traveling like... Uh, my friend does and many others, you know, spending their Mondays and Fridays on the road. Instead, I can spend my Monday and Friday connecting in town. Um, since COVID, it's been different and a little more challenging because people in the past that I would have been meeting with, instead I'm Zooming with and phoning and it's not always as helpful. But uh, certainly in my case, uh, being uh, on site in the city, uh, where although I'm a, a senator for Ontario, most of the people who come to me and look for assistance are people that I engaged with as the police chief or engaged with previously. It's not somebody outside of uh, my circle of friends or circle of acquaintances here in Ottawa. A lot of the work I do is, is would be with uh, volunteer organizations, in particular drug treatment, mental illness, things like that. I, I still uh, do a lot of work with the United Way and, and some of the same things that I did when I was the police chief, to be fair. So I, I'm actually quite lucky compared to some. And because we're not elected, we don't really have constituents in the same way that an MP does. It's really important for me to stay connected to the community. Uh, I mean, it's, it's strange for me now because I'm working from Edmonton and zooming into the Senate. Like that sounds very elegant, Zoom. But I mean, I'm, I'm talking to the Senate on Zoom. But I use social media a lot because I did when I was a journalist. So I'm really active on Twitter. I'm probably too active on Twitter. Uh, I'm on Twitter a lot. I have a Facebook page. I have a YouTube channel, uh, and I have a podcast. So I I connect with a lot of people that way. But just just like Senator White, I mean, he had a great job as a police chief where he did lots of community outreach. For me, as a as a journalist, I, I was doing that too, and so it's been really great that I have all kinds of people that that I know in the community and that network of contacts uh, that that I can stay connected to. But but it's tough. There are only six senators from Alberta, and we have uh, we have one vacancy right now, and we have another senator who's on a bit of a leave. So they're really just four of us um, uh, who are, are working full time right now as senators. And to represent the whole province of Alberta, that's a challenge. Mm. Yeah, totally, hundred percent. Caleb, I see the uh, Caleb, I see the live event Q and A's. Are we to answer those through uh, the no, no worry, chat, uh, or would you like us to jump into some of those? Uh, I'll be, um, I'll, I'll be. Uh, you jump those? Uh, okay. As they come through to me, so you don't need to worry about. Okay. It. Um, okay. okay so thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I got a question here from Felix. Uh, He's asking, is being a senator stressful? Do you enjoy the job? I, I do enjoy it. I mean, I've only been a senator for two years. The first year, being a senator is strange because when you're elected to the House of Commons or to a school board or a legislature, you all come in at the same time. Senators pop in constantly. So you're already sort of, you know, joining, pro joining programming already in progress. So my first year, I got really thrown in the deep end and there was a tremendous amount of work. And then the second year, there was an election. The Senate doesn't sit when there's an election. There was a minority government. The government wasn't recalled for a long time. So we sat for a couple of weeks in December and a couple of weeks in February, and then boom, there was COVID. So it's it's really up 
ended things. So, I mean, being a senator, I suspect it's a lot less stressful than being a, a police detective or or a journalist. It's uh, it, it's a very interesting job. The stresses the stresses are different. It's a lot of time management and something that I wasn't really used to. And it's kind of it's turnabout is fair play. I mean, Senator White was very much in the public eye and under public scrutiny uh, and media scrutiny when he was uh, chief of police. I was the person in the media doing the scrutinizing. So it's a bit of a shock for me to suddenly be on the other end of things and have reporters writing critical things about me. And so that's that's karma. That's that's <laughs> that's, that's, that's the karmic payback. <laughs> yeah, sure thing. Well, yeah, um, I know that in the news a lot, especially very recently, there's been a lot about senators, but not Canadian senators, American senators. <laughs> And they are very different than Canadian senators in many different ways. Please, well, how are they different from you? Uh, well, they're elected, first and foremost. Uh, and they are also extremely powerful. The Senate in the United States, there are only 100 senators. And you think how much bigger the, you know, the American population is than the Canadian population. There are 105 Canadian senators and 100 American senators. Each American state gets two senators, which is sort of interesting because you think about states with big populations like California and New York compared to states like Wyoming um, or, or Vermont. So every senator is extremely powerful in the United States and they're very political. Um, they have to raise a lot of money. Uh, they have to be politicking with donors. They have to be uh, really partisan. And the Canadian Senate is quite different. Even before we went to this more independent model, senators were never as partisan here as they were in the United States. Frankly, they weren't as powerful as they were in the United States. Uh, but I think it is, they are also though parallel jobs because just as in Canada, it's the job of senators to approve legislation that comes from the House of Commons. In the United States, it's the job of the US Senate to approve laws that come from the House of Representatives. So we have parallel histories because we're both based on the British model and we have parallel responsibilities, but I think that my job is a little more chill. Chill. <laughs> <laughs> I've never thought the Senate was chill. I have to be honest. Well, I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine Albert, if we were American senators? I mean, no, I can't imagine uh, being an American politician in any way, actually. It's, uh, I, I think the difference in politics alone sets us apart. I mean, uh, uh, let's look at the two major parties in Canada, Liberal and Conservative, are probably both on the same street on different sides of the center line, where in the United States, they're probably a 16 lane highway and one is on one side and one is on the other. I think that's part of it. And secondly, I, I absolutely agree. I think the fact that we're not elected makes our Senate more valuable when it comes to trying to take on legislative issues fairly than if we were elected. And I think that's the big difference. I, I realize that the public often ask, what, why isn't the Senate elected? But I think they would appreciate how we deal with things like the cannabis legislation, medically assisted dying, some different mental health uh, uh, research we've done in 2004, five, six. I think the work that gets done um, is probably the difference maker for me anyway when it comes to our Senate compared to theirs because we're not having to worry about getting the support of a prime minister or a president in the future to keep our job. Um, I think we keep our job because we do great work and I think it, uh, you know, that will be telltale and I think the senators who are respected are the ones who work hard for their, for their uh, citizens. Yeah, and it, I mean, that's a really, really important point. It's not just that we're independent. Because we don't stand for election, we can't be pressured and lobbied in quite the same way. If if I make a decision that I think is in the best interest of Canada and Alberta, and certain people in Alberta are very, very angry with me, this is a thing that happens, um, I, I have to be brave and let people yell at me on Twitter and know that that is why I'm in the Senate. That's why I have the job security that I have. That's why I have the independence that I have. And if I'm too scared of public opinion to do what I think is right, that's a problem. No, and I think many times, I think many times, Senator, you'll agree, um, it's not necessarily what I think is right even, it's what the public have told us is right. And I, you know, I look at the cannabis 
this legislation. Many would say that, you know, that uh, it must be difficult for senators to agree with this when personally they may not have made that choice. But but or but as a country, the country made that choice. And, and I think Canadians were ready for something that even many of us may not have been ready for. Right. Yeah, totally. Um, as difficult that is, it's still our job. Right. Yeah, 100%. Uh, that, that's that's an excellent point. Um, so currently, as you, you very well know, we are in the midst of a pandemic as disrupted fundamentally uh, how we live our lives as Canadians. But it's very interesting to see perhaps how it's changed our institutions. So how has the recent epidemic changed being a senator? Oh, it's changed really radically, especially for those of us who don't live in Ottawa. I mean, I, I mean, I, I've only come to Ottawa for one block of sittings since the pandemic began, because at the beginning, they told those of us who lived outside of Ottawa not to come, that it wasn't safe, only come if you could travel in a private vehicle. So senators came from Montreal, they came from Toronto. Um, Senator Larry Campbell, Who's an <laughs> senator drove in his in his camper trailer from Vancouver to Ottawa. Um, I, I didn't do that because because I'm not Larry Campbell. But uh, so it was tough for me. I could watch the live stream and I could send questions to my fellow senators to ask on my behalf, but I really felt very cut off. So it's much better for me now because now I can use Zoom and I can take part in Senate proceedings. I can make speeches. I can ask questions. I can take part in the debate. There are a lot of people who are concerned that we're making it a little too easy because I think there are some legitimate questions that have been raised primarily by some of our conservative colleagues who've said, wait a minute, if senators can just come in on Zoom, you know, how you know, maybe the next time Paula Simons doesn't feel like flying to Ottawa, um, she'll just Zoom in. So I think it is important that we not make this the default setting, but in this time of an emergency, I think it's really important that we're using technology for Senate sittings and for committee hearings that we will allow people from across the country because some of our Senate colleagues, you know, uh, Senator Duncan comes from Yukon. Uh, Yukon's a long way from Ottawa and there's a 14 day quarantine rule uh, if you come to the Yukon from a you know from an area that has a higher rate of COVID. Uh, for our colleagues in the Atlantic provinces, they have a similar 14 day rule. It's really difficult to ask people to fly back and forth during a pandemic. And so I hope I hope that we don't give up meetings. I hope that once we have a vaccine and uh, it's safe to travel that we do return to Ottawa. But I think it also wouldn't be a bad thing, you know, because sometimes a senator, you know, needs a hip replacement surgery or um, you know, has a family calamity. And it would be nice if in emergency situations, people could still come in via Zoom sometimes to committees at least. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, I think necessity is probably uh, helpful in letting us do this, but I don't think it's something we want to get used to. I, I, I miss um, backroom banter when yeah. we're trying to make decisions and come to resolution and come to agreements, it's much more difficult to walk out of a room if, if you're physically in that room than if you're in a Zoom meeting. And I think it's helpful that we have those. I also sit on the National Security Intelligence Committee, which means I go to a, a, a secure location uh, most Fridays, and then we have people from across Canada who go to CSIS, uh, Canadian Security Intelligence um, offices as well, which are still not the best because those meetings as well often have witnesses who are also zooming in. It just doesn't have that same flavor. You can't read the body language. Um, they can finish their answer maybe a little quicker than you would like them to. Um, I think it will be um, important that we get back to the Senate when we can, but I also think it's important that we can continue our work until that time. So I agree completely. I think you're right on the money. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm glad that the Senate is able to continue. Um, various senators certainly champion different issues. Uh, some more single focus with more of a single focus than others. Are there any specific issues that you would say that you've cha championed or at least tried to advance uh, during your time as a senator? Um, you know, when I first came in, in particular, because in Ottawa as the police chief, I had 
raised a lot of money and awareness around drug addiction for young people. And I continued working on drug addiction. In fact, I still do. Uh, just before this meeting, I was on a Zoom meeting about we're trying to add 15 beds to a drug treatment center for uh, young females here in the city of Ottawa, as an example. Um, so my focus was on what parts of legislation could we impact on when it came to drugs. And we had, as most people know in Canada, we have an opioid epidemic. We have about 14 people a day who are dying in this country today from accidental opioid overdoses. Um, and at the time, it wasn't illegal to possess the ingredients for opioids, for fentanyl in particular. So I, I drafted legislation or had it drafted and passed a private member's bill that forced the government to change the rules and regulations around possessing precursors of opioids. It's probably the, even including my... 32 years in policing, one of the most satisfying things I felt I, I was able to accomplish, primarily because most people said that we would not be able to move the uh, yardsticks on that, and that a decade earlier, the United States and Australia had done that, and Canada still did not follow suit. So for me, I guess it was trying to attack addiction from a different place with a different lens than I had done in the past. So uh, for me, I think that's probably the piece that stands out. And I have to say that I'm new enough to the Senate that I haven't really found a big issue like that to champion. My first year, as I say, I was thrown into the deep end and had a lot of legislation that I had to deal with that dealt specifically with the oil industry in Alberta, uh, where I had some background, but um, striking that balance between uh, energy and the environment is really tricky. Since COVID, I've been focused on a, a couple of key issues. One has to do with the uh, the way Canada's municipalities are dealing with uh, the COVID crisis because they don't have the money available to them that provinces and the federal government do. And so I've been meeting with mayors all across Alberta, trying to listen to them, hear their problems, trying to advocate for more uh, support for municipalities. Uh, I'm a member of the Senate Transportation and Communications Committee. So I've been working a lot with airlines and airports, meeting with airport leaders from across Western Canada, talking about some of the challenges that are facing our airports. But I haven't found my passion project the way Senator White has. Um, I, I guess I'll have another 23 years in the Senate to figure out uh, what my legacy piece should be, but I'm not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> totally, you have time, you have time. Um, I have a question here from Paige. Um, she wonders, uh, it seems like this is a really long-term position with the work that you do. There's not a lot of immediate gratification. How do you keep yourselves motivated to keep fighting the good fight? You know, that is a fantastic question. It's a fantastic question. And for me, because I worked for a daily newspaper, I was so used to having that instant gratification. I mean, I worked in a job where I made a thing. I came in the morning, I did some interviews, I did some research, I sat down at my computer in the afternoon, I wrote the column, it was online that night, I'd get Twitter feedback right away, you know, it'd be in the paper the next day, and then the paper would be thrown out and I'd be on to the next thing. And it's been one of the hardest things for me to adapt to as a senator, not to be in that adrenaline feedback loop of getting the constant, the constant, you know, the the, the clicks, the um, you know, the, the 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 dopamine of having someone pay attention to you, because really people don't pay attention to the Senate very much. So I have really had to have this little, you know, Zen moment talking to myself, and 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 dig in and look for the satisfaction of other things. One of the things that makes the Senate awesome is that it is like being at the best university in the world. Maybe that doesn't sound all that sexy to you guys, but you know, our fellow senators are some of the smartest, most creative people I've ever met. And they come from so many different backgrounds and you can walk into a room and this is what I'm really missing. You know, you walk into the back room where they put the, with the, where they put the hummus and the cheese plate and you can have a conversation that is so enlightening and so engaging and the people in there there's a spark of electricity and so I, I i get my i get my my jollies from that now but it has been really hard to not have that immediate that immediate applause mm -hmm. 
Senator White, have you had any experience with that or is it all old hat? What was that again? Sorry. Uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, it sounds like being a senator is an incredibly long term job. There's not a lot of yeah. immediate gratification with what you do. How do you stay motivated to keep going? You know, for policing wasn't much different, to be fair. Seldom do you actually investigate, conclude in the same shift. It often went on for months, if not years, and particularly in some of the investigations I was involved in, some homicides and things that took, in some cases, a couple of years and, and a lot of investigators. So I've always looked for something in the community that would give me that immediate gratification. When I'm not painting a room in the house, which also gives me immediate gratification. So for me, it was about the community outreach and the community engagement. When I was a police chief, I also taught at both universities here in Ottawa on a Tuesday night and a Thursday night, which I got great gratification from and learned a lot from uh, students about policing, about community, about engagement, and often left there probably learning more that night than they learned from me. Um, so I haven't stopped that. I still teach at a couple of uni three universities. I do I mentor some uh, master's students for thesis. And so I do a lot of other things outside of uh, outside of the job to try and keep my mind moving and alive. Um, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I miss most um, is that banter piece and, and that uh, Senator Simons talked about because I think it is that connectivity and um, I'm missing that value added piece to the Senate. I find it difficult um, as much as Zoom works well to find the true value add that I was finding previously. I often said the committees were the most fun, but it was the before the committee and after the committee discussions that often brought the most value. Yeah, I mean, I was on two committees last year that did something quite unprecedented and we had big trips. I mean, Senate travel is not unprecedented, but this was unprecedented for hearings. And so I ended up in every part of Canada over the course of about three weeks. I went from, you know, Terrace and Prince Rupert, British Columbia, all the way to Newfoundland and pretty much every province in between. And when you travel with people, um, you really get to know them in a different kind of way. And it, and it was quite nice because I was new to the Senate. Some of the conservative senators, you know, there was a little bit of, you know, people were sort of sizing each other up. And then we ended up having, you know, the best time. I discovered that, I don't know if there's anybody on this call from Terrace, BC. I discovered that Terrace, BC had some of the best Indian food in Canada, some of the best tandoori I'd, I'd ever had. Um, and, you know, so sitting sitting with a bunch of senators eating eating our tandoori um, and, our, and our samosas at the end of a very long day of travel and hearings. Um, it's you know, I guess we're not supposed to talk about, the, we're not supposed to make it sound like too much fun because people will think then that, you know, <laughs> that we're not earning our money. But um, but the camaraderie of the people and, and because we have different political opinions, that's what makes it fun. Those debates and those arguments when they're not personal, but when you're really, you know, arguing about ideas and how to make this a better country, that's, that's the fun part and the tandoori. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, well, that's great. Uh, uh, I just before we move on to the next bit, I have a question here from Eden. Uh, she's asking, what has surprised you the most about your role as a senator? I'll go first, if that's okay, uh, Senator. You know what? Probably, um, I thought it would be less political. I thought that because senators were in for a long time, um, number even previously when like back when I was appointed a number of us three out of seven had no political engagement previously so I thought there would be more or less politics involved so the influence of the House of Commons I think is probably the surprise for me and maybe I was naive because I always said felt as a police officer and a police chief I should walk the middle of the road politically and try to find value on both the right and the left and I, I was very successful at that I, found, I thought I could do that as well in the Senate. It's a little more difficult than I thought. Um, I will say inside the Senate, probably less so now since the appointment of, of uh, people through a different process and, and uh, appointed as an independent instead of finding their way to independence. Um, but, but I still feel that influence, like at one point we had a piece of legislation a year and a half ago when a number of cabinet ministers came and sat in the Senate while we were voting. And not that, there was, uh, I, I don't really care that they're there and they're not going to change the way I vote, but the feeling was that they were there to try and influence a vote, even if it wasn't true. So that that political 
connectiveness, I think I find difficult and at times distasteful. I, I, there's times when I find it um, not very enjoyable. Probably the piece I dislike the most. Right. Do you know what I've found the strangest is the sense, you know, in on the prairies, and I think it's probably also true in Cape Breton, people are just people. They're not fancy people, you know, and maybe some guy has more money and some guy has more, a little more political power, but really there isn't this kind of ceremonial Downton Abbey way where, you know, you're, you respect them. So Ottawa is really weird because when you become a senator, people open the door for you and they say, good morning, Madame la Senatrice. And I, I, I wasn't used to people, how can I put this? I was a reporter. I wasn't used to people treating me with respect. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think Senator White knows what I mean. It took me a long time to get used to people opening doors for me and deferring to me and calling me Madam Senator. And uh, my family thought it was so funny. Um, you know, my, my daughter, when she was she was 21 when I was appointed to the Senate and um, she started calling me Madam Senator around the house because my family thought this was a hoot. But it is, it is a funny thing. There's all of this tradition and respect that is accorded to senators. And I eventually came to the conclusion that the senators all, all, all called each other senator at first because we keep changing and you can't remember everybody's name for those first weeks. I just called everybody senator. Hello, senator. Hello, senator. Because it meant, um, but my friend Patty Labacan Benson, who's a uh, a senator from from Alberta. She and I were appointed at the same time, and our desks were next to each other. So just like in kindergarten class, we were sort of anchored together, and we would pass notes. And for the first little while, she made a chart like a bird watcher, so we could try to figure out who all the other senators were. And she mm -hmm. would tick tick people off. Um, I don't mean she tick people off. I mean maybe she did too, but I mean she, <laughs> she, she, she would she would mark them off once she figured out you know who was who was who. So a lot of the, the very formalities of the Senate, I, I was not used to. The day you're sworn in, they read a proclamation that is something like out of Narnia, out of Care Paravel. Um, they read you, you know, whereas our good and trusty servant, you know, shall give loyal allegiance to her majesty. And you think, oh my goodness, I've, I've traveled back in time to some kind of, you know, uh, sword and sorcery fantasy novel. Uh, I'm still not used to that part, the the bit where where people kind of treat me treat me nicely. I'm not used to it. Oh. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's good feedback about the senator, or damning feedback about the journalism industry. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, you know, when when you're when you're an officer on the beat, they treat you differently than when you're the chief of police. But I think even then, it's a <laughs> The Senate is, I mean, do you find that, Senator White, that the formality is? Yeah, it's, It's. Uh, I mean, I don't know if I noticed it as much, I mean, living in the city beforehand. So people, I mean, I'm still called chief way more often than I'm ever called senator, even by security staff on the Hill. Doesn't seem to matter. In fact, the emails I had tonight about drug treatment all referred to, chief, are you busy tonight for a phone call? So it didn't shift as much for me as uh, as uh, many other people. I think though, you know, one thing I, I do want to make a point of, because I know we don't have a, a ton of more time, is that I do think Canada might be one of the only countries in the world that anybody uh, can aspire to be just about anything. Mm -hmm. I, I, I look around the Senate, uh, and I even look around the House of Commons, and we have people there who've done every possible job. Um, and, and I think uh, Canadians have come to accept and expect that I can put anyone into those roles. Um, and I don't think that's true. And I particularly look having just watched an election in the United States. Um, I don't think that's true to our, to our friends in the South. Um, so, so I think that's something we should be very proud of as a country. I mean, I come from very humble beginnings. My dad was a coal miner, grade four education. Uh, after 38 years in the mines, most times we saw police officers in my community were to arrest my friends. Um, I didn't think I could get to be a police officer, let alone ever think for for any sake that I could actually be a, a senator in this country. So I, I do think it shows that, um, that uh, unlike most countries, we do have some opportunities not everybody has. So and I, it makes me appreciate that. Yeah. Definitely. 
Definitely. Well, as you know, Scouts Canada is a youth-led organization, so that means that within our highest levels of administration, there are youth representatives on our board of governors and our national teams. Uh, what would you say to the viewers at home who might aspire to become senators one day? Uh, well, it, well it, it, <laughs> you, you go first, Senator White. No, you know what? I, I was uh, a Cub, a Scout adventurer from the time yeah. I was as young as I remember eating KFC at the uh, the father and son banquet, you know, uh, with Akela there telling us what to do. Um, in uh, as were my brothers, it was always the equalizer. In fact, in my hometown, we had very little, but if you had a scout program, you could do something that that anybody else could do. It was the equalizer in my community, and in fact, my 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 daughter is a is a a cub here, although she's not attending right now because of COVID. Um, so for me, it, it proves to me that that program does build something in you, uh, mm -hmm. but also that uh, it does give you a path that not everybody gets because it, it certainly gave me some real openings in life that um, I wouldn't have probably had otherwise. And that included being included in an organization that treated me with respect and uh, allowed me to be part of something, uh, a part of a team uh, um, and, and I truly appreciate my scouting time. So I guess more than anything else, anybody can get there. Uh, and I think scouting is helpful in building the foundation and the building blocks to get there. I have to confess that I was a very bad brownie. Oh. I was a very, very bad brownie. Like, like, I was, I was never, I'm not even surprised. <laughs> I, was, I was never a sixer. I, 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 I was bad at getting bad. Like I, I couldn't braid. I couldn't camp. I was a, I was a disaster. So I have to say that my daughter was a was a very good um, spark and brownie. But I think I think she gets that from her dad because my husband was a my husband was a uh, was a cub and a scout. He was a sixer. I was I was not. I was a failed brownie. Um, so I, I I can't I can't credit my success to the to the to, to the scouting movement. But I will say what's fascinating about being a senator is that there is no particular path that takes you there. I mean, some people are very political and they want to be in the House of Commons. They want to be political staffers. They, you know, they, they want to be in part of the political process. What's kind of neat about the Senate, some people there are people who were career politicians, but a lot of us are not. Um, you know, there are writers. Uh, you know, one of, one of our sen senators is an award-winning novelist. Mm. One of them is a you know, uh, he was a dancer, choreographer, theater director. Uh, one of them was a, an acclaimed art historian. We have social workers and teachers and I think four people who were police officers. Um, uh, you know, we have people who come from all kinds of backgrounds. So the important thing to prepare yourself to be a senator is just to prepare yourself to be a good citizen, to throw yourself with passion into whatever inspires you. Uh, it doesn't have to be politics. It doesn't have to be law. We've got a lot of lawyers and former judges in the Senate, but we also have people from a much more eclectic range of backgrounds. And so, you know, if you aspire to be a senator, um, I guess the first thing is to just be a be a really good citizen. I don't just mean like, like be a good Canadian, but I mean be involved in your community be passionate about what you do, strive for excellence, um, strive to make your community a better place. And I, I guess those are the prerequisites to be a senator. Hmm. Exactly. Isn't that a great tribute to the strength of our democracy that you don't have to be in the, you know, the upper echelon of supposed upper echelon of society. You can be from all walks of life. Um, I have a, another question here from a scout. Uh, who asks, you know, building on your 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 uh, statement, Senator Simons, about how you checked off all the boxes with the other senators. It's a big job to know all the senators because uh, there's so many of them. Do, do you and, they, know? and they and they change. Yeah, <laughs> and they change on a very frequent <laughs> basis. Yeah, so I think I, I think I can name them all now. Oh. Um, I, I think I think I you know it, it took me it took me a year maybe to be able to. All right. <laughs> that, that, that's not quite true. I, I, I am a quicker study than that. It, it, it's, it's not that hard, but it is. Um, it's a lot of different people and a lot of different personalities. Right. What one of the challenges of having this many independent senators is that the independent senators were told be independent. 
And if you put and there are about 80 of us who are independent senators. So if you put 80 people who have a background in being leaders in their former lives, you got a lot of type A personalities, a lot of alphas mm -hmm. in the room. And without party discipline, without someone being the boss, sometimes it is hard to get our three independent groups to figure out what they're doing because um, there's a fair bit of, I wouldn't say ego, but I would say that you've got a lot of people who are used to being the smartest person in whatever room they were in, and now they're all in the same room together. So you need some interpersonal skills to manage the, that many big personalities. Right, 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 totally, totally. Um, OK, so then going uh, going back to um, the concept of, I suppose, youth in general, why do you think that it is important for youth like, uh, I suppose, like me, like those who are joining us at home to remain civically engaged? Well, I mean, I think I mean, we can see right now with this pandemic what happens when people don't put community ahead of themselves. I mean, it's really important to know what's going on in your community so that you can make smart choices about what you're going to do next. But it's really important that we remember that this is the community that we share. And that's true whether it's it's Toronto or, you know, a, a little town on the Canadian prairie. Um, you have to live in your community. And if you want your community to be healthy, if you want your community to be a place where you can succeed, uh, if you want your community to be a place where um, the economy is strong and where people feel safe, if you want your community to be a place where people feel that they can be creative and original, you, we all need to be part of, of that process. We all need to be part of that team. Uh, I mean, right now we're part of that team by hiding in our houses with the door shut. But in, in reality, um, when COVID is over, we need to be part of that team by coming out and asking what we can do to, to you know, to rebuild this country, to pick up after, after this devastation. I mean, it's a bit like having your community hit by a hurricane or a blizzard. Right. I mean, we need to shelter now to protect one another. Right. But when, when this is over, we need to come out and figure out what each and every one of us can do, um, whether we're 12 years old or, you know, 112 to mm. somehow figure out where Canada goes from here, what we've learned from this crisis and what what lessons we can take to to enrich this country and our communities going forward. Right. I think we've been very lucky as well with, you know, if we look at H1N1 or other um, epidemics we've had, we've never seen one that impacted on the whole um, as this has. I think it uh, um, maybe lulled us into a sense of safety that wasn't real. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement, I think, that coming from this, we will be stronger, although different. Uh, and hopefully when we have the next COVID and there will be another COVID, uh, it's a matter of when um, that will be better prepared. And, and I'm not, that's not pointing at our country. I'm, that's pointing at every country because nobody was prepared for this. Not one country um, was uh, had the uh, the panacea answer to when that hits. We know how we're going to deal with it. They all had to, to do it on the fly. So hopefully we'll come out of this stronger, as you say, ready to build, but also be more prepared for what comes next. And I hope that, you know, I mean, it's been very frustrating for me as somebody who was a journalist for many years who believed in reporting the truth who, i believed that if i gave people the facts and the evidence that they would draw the right conclusions from that right it's, it's been heartbreaking for me to see how many people and i think it comes from fear and the fear is real the fear the fear is justified i'm scared too i mean i think it's okay for us to admit that this is a scary time um but what isn't useful is to take that fear and to cover our eyes and our ears and say this isn't happening it doesn't matter it's not real it's fake it's a hoax uh, the rules don't need to apply to me because i'm healthy i'll be fine um it's been very disheartening for me as somebody who has always championed facts and mm. scientific evidence to mm. see that people aren't willing to listen to the science and i think what we need to be good citizens is also the critical thinking skills to look at the information that's coming at us to be able to sort the truth from the lie 
uh, to be able to understand what we need to do together as communities to get through this. And it isn't to ignore our responsibilities to one another. Right, right. And I suppose then, uh, Senator Simons, that that is a great way for youth to be civically engaged right now, is to make sure that we are all following the proper safety guidelines that have been put forth by the public health authorities and the government. Um, it doesn't have to just be, you know, a, a, vol a, a huge volunteering thing. You don't have to spearhead the food bank initiative to make a difference in our communities. And certainly this is a great one. That doesn't mean that we can't, uh, we have to be disconnected. Uh, scouting is running virtually, uh, as uh, I hope uh, we all know. Uh, other programs I'm sure are as well. Schools are back in session um, in a lot of places. I'm not sure about every, but everywhere, but certainly in a lot of places. Um, unfortunately, uh, I'd love to keep continuing this conversation. It certainly has been very interesting, at least for me. Uh, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Um, thank you so much, Senator Simons and Senator White, for all of your poignant uh, comments, poignant thoughts, and giving us a window uh, into the lives and the inner workings of the Canadian Senate. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And as well, please thank you uh, for the many people who sent in questions. I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to all of them, but thanks for participating in this uh, in this town hall session or more appropriately, this fireside chat. Um, please as well, to everybody joining, uh, joining us from home, uh, remember to look out for more such events. There will be sure to be uh, occurring in the future where other senators will be interviewed about other uh, topics that will be previewed uh, as we move through the virtual scouting year. Um, I also hope that uh, the Canadian Senate, well, more specifically, youth are encouraged, hopefully, by this discussion to remain civically engaged and also be active uh, in our communities, whether that be from staying at home or uh, out with our various organizations. So thank you once again, everybody, for attending. Thank you so much to the senators for joining thank us. Thank you very much. Senator Simon, and, Senator White. And, and thank you, Caleb, for being here. Thank you, Caitlin, for being a terrific moderator. That was, I mean. <laughs> You're too kind. You're too kind. But thank you. Uh, your, your insight was, was incredible. Uh, thanks, everybody. Happy scouting. Take care. Happy Be scouting. safe.